firm and uh, headed up the finance department, uh, working for clients such as Goldman Sachs, Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, and then I moved over to um, career coaching uh, before coming over to the UK and, and then joining 1080. And I apologize ahead of time. I've got just the remnants of a cold still. So if you might get a cough once in a while, I, I apologize. Thanks, Harold. Thanks. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether we did go live straight away. So I'm just going to say hello and welcome again to everybody who is listening to this session live and those of you who are listening to it afterwards. Um, please feel free to comment, to ask questions in the chat. Um, we've got a series of questions that we're going to be answering. Oh, I'm going to get Sarah and Harold to answer. Um, and But if you want to ask any particular questions, then please jump in and and ask them and say we'll try and get through as many as possible. Okay, so we start, let's dive into the session. So the first question I want to, to ask you both is, is what do actually headhunters do? You know, we use the term headhunting or search professionals a lot, but do people really understand what recruiters do? So Sarah, I'm gonna to come to you first and ask you that question. Sure. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, headhunters, search professionals, recruiters are really there to identify, to engage, to introduce people to organisations who are looking to recruit, uh, in essence, a, a matchmaking service uh, for the workplace. Um, they often are there as well to provide quite significant support around the process. Um, uh, not a lot of organisations have the kind of capacity, the capability. So really smoothing the wheels as organisations get to know candidates through a series of meetings and just making sure that that all works really well, such that candidates have a really good experience and organisations are well supported in terms of their recruiter brand. Excellent. And Harold, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I thought Sarah did a great job. <laughs> she did, bless her. Okay. Okay, so following on from that then, Sarah, if we think about different types of recruiters, because I know um, yep. you, you said you specialise in education and executive search, etc. What What different types of recruiters are there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so there are two main types of, of recru recruiters, um, retained search and contingency recruitment. So uh, I'm in retained search and the difference between the two is, is quite simple. In retained search, the recruiter, myself, is, is paid, uh, an well, you agree to pay, a, uh, an organisation agrees to pay a certain amount. It can be upfront, it can be through the process um, and they work on an exclusive basis uh, generally, um, meaning that we are dedicated to, to work working on that search and to getting them a, an appointment. Um, in contrast, contingency recruitment works on, I guess, what's best described as a, a, a no win, no fee basis. Quite a number may be uh, given the brief and uh, they then go out and use their uh, databases or they might go and do some finding uh, and try and put the successful candidate in front of the organisation, at which point they would then get their fee. Um, there are, as you just alluded to, Alison, different flavours of search firms. You will get some here focusing CFOs, they will focus in HR directors, or you might get somebody who's working within finance and banking, or, or like ourselves, we, we do purpose-driven sectors. Um, so there's lots of different flavours, and, and that sort of might direct where you then go in terms of choosing a recruiter to build a relationship with. And, and just pick up on that point about choosing a recruiter, where, where would you typically go to to find a specific recruiter? How would you search for that? Um, so typically you might, I mean, there are some big names out there. There, there are some large organisations all the way to the very small boutique type firms. Um, in terms of how you might select who you who might approach, and I think Harold might come on to that uh, in a second, but uh, Ask, ask your friends, ask your colleagues, ask your networks um, who they would recommend. They're like any sector. There are there are recruitment firms that are really, really good. And then there are some that uh, you know won't necessarily uh, be that good. So getting those recommendations, if you're trying to build those relationships, uh, will be important. Um, but also using 
Google, you're looking at job advertisement pages uh, online and, and, and which search firms or recruiters are supporting the kind of roles that you're interested in and go, go that way. Yeah, sounds like good advice. Harold, do you want to jump in there? Sure. Actually, I'm going to back up a minute in terms of different types of recruiters. I think from, from the candidate's point of view, you also have to recognize the motivation uh, of the recruiter. So when you work with a firm such as Sarah's, it's retained search. They're looking for the best fit. And um, if you're in a contingency and you need to pay the rent, you have to get um, assignments done. And so it's, it's not... When you get called from a recruiter to say, look, I, I want to send in your resume, um, when you, I, I wouldn't put uh, too much confidence in a call from a contingency. There are many professionals out there, don't get me wrong, but um, I'm biased towards the retained search, primarily because contingency, sometimes it can feel like your resume is a lottery ticket and they're just trying to throw it in there to um, you know, get a win. Whereas with a retained firm, uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into putting the, the candidate forward uh, because there's a commitment there, a much stronger commitment. So um, I, I just wanted to raise that um, because it, it's important to understand where your recruiter is coming from and where their maybe their urgencies lie as well. Yeah, good point. Okay, so if we move on to thinking about how to approach a recruiter. Harold, do you want to take us through this? And this is a question I, I often get asked a, a lot by my clients. So what's the most effective way to approach a, recruit, a recruiter if you haven't got a relationship with them? Sure, and Sarah's touched on this. Uh, number one is networking. If you can form a, a connection to a recruiter, it's a much easier email to write uh, or phone call to say, you know, so-and-so, Introduce me, recommended I, I connect to you. At least you, you're more likely to get a, a viewing, particularly if you're in a, a time where that particular recruiter isn't looking for positions specifically for your role. So um, networking, I'd say, is number one. Otherwise, nothing wrong with a cold call. I would uh, definitely uh, do the research on a recruiter you're not going to, if you're a CFO, you're not going to send your resume out to, you know, an IT focused firm. So uh, whether it's through LinkedIn or just online, do your research to make sure you're hitting the, the right uh, recruiter. And, you know, in terms of an approach, no one recruiter has all the clients in the market. So as with regard to an approach, I think you should be uh, focused and um, not just send it out, as I say, to everyone, but um, you know, pick a handful of recruiters that uh, are relevant for your work. Yeah, really helpful. Um, Sarah, do you want to add anything to that? Or? No, I think that's exactly right. I think uh, like anything in life, the more tailored you are, the the more uh, effort you're going to put into those approaches. And that will come across. Um, that's if you're contacting organisations, that's if you're making any applications or you're talking to recruiters. Um, if, if you send the same email uh, to uh, 100 recruiters, it, it does it can look like that so do be choosier uh, and you're most likely to get uh, better results in terms of that engagement yeah brilliant there's a, a question just come in here from 1080 saying is it important to keep relationships with recruiters while you're still in a role and you both mentioned networking so i'm assuming you would agree with that how old do you want to oh sarah sarah, sarah jump in there you go. Uh, i was just going to say uh, yes, short answer. And I think if you consider their relationship like uh, teamwork, I've had candidates who didn't, uh, they were in the short list, but didn't make it. And, you know, every two to three months would just send me some in industry information. And it's, you know, I, maybe I already knew it didn't matter. The point is uh, they're trying to maintain the relationship. So that's that's just one way to do it. 
Yeah, and I think to a certain extent, if they're being, you know, if you if you if you like them, if you enjoy engaging with them on those uh, occasional conversations that you have, then absolutely keep it going. If if um, it's like when you sign up to one estate agent to look at one house and they keep coming at you with everything and anything, um, and it's just really annoying, then I would ask them to remove you from from their book. So it's it's really, you know, do you enjoy it? Like networking, do you enjoy the interactions? Do you find them beneficial to you um, in thinking about where you might go to next even if you're not there so I, I would judge it on that basis but it's never going to be a bad thing to have that relationship if you're enjoying it no, perfect brilliant okay so moving on to to what can candidates expect from a recruiter so Sarah do you want to start with that question Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, sort of change it maybe to what can a candidate expect from a good recruiter? <laughs> um, uh, I think to get to know you, uh, absolutely, uh, to, to understand what you're interested in, what your skills are, what you enjoy, and then to tailor uh, the opportunities that they're putting in front of you. Um, to once you get into processes to really understand what the organization is looking for so that you can be thinking about how you might uh, present your experience your skills your interests um, as well as what will be expected from you in the process you should never uh, work through a recruiter and turn up and be surprised by perhaps what you're being put through there, there should definitely be a, a, a candidate care element there in terms of helping you to prepare and really to keep you updated uh, if you are in those processes and to provide good feedback whether it's a positive or a, a outcome or, or a no, so that you can then take that forward and, and use it in the in the future. Um, th there is a bit of a difference there between you know what you'll get from a, a contingent recruiter and what you get from a retained uh, search. Uh, the knowledge in retained search of what the organisation is looking for and, and so on might be uh, stronger, and therefore you might have more uh, engagement with with them. Um, uh, throughout the process, they might do a long listing before a short listing, for instance, and um, there might be a, a sort of proper process from start to finish, whereas with contingency research, you might just be uh, going in uh, and they're waiting to find people to interview for, for the, b b the right people to interview. So you know, it can be slightly different, but generally good practice, those things that I just said. Um, and I think if you're not getting that, um, then uh, alarm bells really, you know, are, are they really interested in you? Um, uh, and you know, is, is this a good place to be? Yeah, I, just, I thought uh, Sarah was spot on. I would just uh, kind of relate from the recruiter's side. Don't forget, we're in the middle. You have the client and you, and we're uh, trying to keep things moving. Sometimes the client has a business trip or year end is coming up and they're just locked in their office. And so one of the hardest things to do is to what we call keep a candidate warm. Uh, in those times because we have no news. But uh, I think uh, for it, people that are in that position, uh, I would just try to um, remember the mantra, no news is no news. That's all it is. Uh, even though it's frustrating and you want the quit, you know, you want a yes or a no to just move on with your life. Sometimes it's just stuck and there's nothing the recruiter can do because they don't control the situation. They just manage it. They should update you, though. Yeah, of course. Communication, of course, of course, yes. But we do hear a lot of people saying they don't hear back, and that that is the biggest frustration. So, I, I go back to your point, Sarah. What should you expect from a good recruiter? Um, there is a technical question here that I'm going to throw to Sarah from our LinkedIn user uh, around: um, Should you? What are your thoughts on signing an open-ended NDA um, of? of for a role. I'm not sure around the specifics on that, Sarah. Do you want to take a minute to have a think about that? Um, yeah. Have you come across that? It's not something I have to say that I've come across, actually. Mm. Um, it, but that may be in, in, in my sectors that it's it's uh, open, that they tend, because they are 
Um, some of them are public sector organisations. Some of them work with that kind of an ethos that there's uh, an openness and transparency uh, piece. It's um, although I have to say, looking at job pages and so on, I do say uh, CFO role, organisation confidential. So I don't know if it refers to that. I mean, I think you should only ever um, sign up to anything that you're comfortable with doing. And I think that includes to whether something has an expiry date or not. Um, but sorry, I'm not sure I uh, I can advise on that because it's not something I have a great deal of experience with. Harold, I don't know if you do. Yeah, I'll jump in because I, I think uh, in my, my experience, I've only seen that request in IT related um, assignments because sometimes there's a, I mean, you could see it anywhere where there's a new business ID and you're going to be the first hire or the second hire in the management team and they want to keep everything quiet. Um, but with NDAs, my personal um, thought is, uh, number one, I would never sign anything with, without an expiry date. Um, and that's, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, generally, I understand the purpose of the NDA as it relates in the context of, of technology, where they're, you know, the person who is being interviewed could be privy uh, out of necessity to certain details of the new role. Um, and there, I would I would say the same as Sarah. You know, go with what you're comfortable with. Uh, a one year or two year NDA. You know, in technology, two years is like a decade. So um, that's your call. Uh, and then. Role specifics, I personally, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Um, <clears throat> so I would, I would first ask the question, why, not, why are there no role specifics? Uh, and in general, I would, you know, ask them, what is your reason for asking me to sign this? And maybe from the answer, it will become more clear whether or not you're comfortable uh, doing it. Yeah. Good answer. I like that. It's just that NDA is a legal document, which could, you know, inadvertently could end, you could end up in uh, <clears throat> peril. So I'm just very uh, wary. I'd want to really know what's the, what's the reasoning behind this. Yeah. I suppose from my experience, I have seen it where they, they've recruited some, but they are trying to recruit for somebody's in post and therefore they don't want any kind of, confidentiality leaks but but yes i think it comes back to what you said about being comfortable with that okay um interesting question is having a relationship with a recruiter enough sarah do you want to jump in for that one oh it's all right. no, well i'd say no but i'll let harold expand on that from a broader perspective <laughs> well, as in the role of career coach uh, you know, certainly our, our focus is for the candidate to get, uh, carry on with their career. And uh, certainly working with recruiters is one element of that. Uh, however, uh, in terms of how people spend their time, uh, I think networking to, along with recruiters, but networking and trying to get in to meet decision makers is the uh, most, most effective way uh, to spend your time. However, recruiters have roles and, you know, they have excellent roles often with, you know, international companies. So therefore the uh, compensation is going to be at an international level. So, um, you know, it's not enough, but it's, it's, uh, certainly not the only thing. Yeah, and I, I would only add that if you think about the sort of how we've been describing recruitment um, in retain search, I, I'm very much led by the client. So if a client gives me a brief, I go out and find uh, to, to, to find and engage and create a, a field of candidates that relate to that specific brief. Um, so I don't tend to be working outside of client briefs. Always good to get to know people but that's my main focus. And in um, contingent search, they'll again be looking through the lens of the, the searches that they know or the appointments that they know are there to, to be filled. Um, and therefore they won't necessarily always be thinking about the, the breadth that you might be interested in or contact. So, so I think um, Harold's absolutely right. There are lots of other things that you can be doing proactively as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we would always suggest as a, a career transition coaches a broader perspective. So it, it's never a one size fits all, depending on the type of role you're looking for, the level at which you're you're looking as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so if we go back to um, Harold, how give us some of your top tips, Harold, on how to get yourself noticed. Uh, okay, I think my my top tip. Uh, because I think it uh, it's the most important. I, just the word metrics. You know, when uh, recruiters receive a lot of resumes and they have a finite amount of time every day, so you want to be seen. And to do that, you need metrics. It's not good enough to say I'm a good team player, but if you talk about I've managed a you know multicultural, multinational team across six countries uh, and it's a team of 250 people that helps me uh, as a recruiter put you into context and you'll be a, you know easier to fit you into roles that I may be working in um, also it, it allows in a way you're helping the recruiter help you because with metrics you know you're giving them ammunition if you want to call it that when they write up your candidate report and submit it to the client if they feel that you're a fit, uh, that information will get through to the client. So just imagine that, you're, in fact, you're writing to a decision maker and sending them that resume. And um, you know, motherhood phrases like, you know, good team player, everyone can write that. So what separates you from everyone else? Um, so I just, I'm going to just stop there and just, because I really want to focus and emphasize metrics as a way to uh, differentiate yourself and get noticed. Okay, and and Sarah, do you want to add anything to that? What what do you uh, look for when you? <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree with Harold. Actually, I think you know being understand to able to able to understand the kind of context and the, the sort of nature of the role that you have does does help you place it. But I come back to the point I made earlier on. You know, if you're approaching, the, the best thing to do is to tailor it. So find a person that you're writing to make it um not personal because you probably won't know them but you know find a way to sort of get the hook um in there um such that they'll reply to you um and and i'm afraid to say it's very very unlikely that they'll reply to you if it's a very generic email that has clearly been sent to a lot of people yeah yeah we'll see that yeah brilliant okay thank you guys um this, this comes up a, a, a lot as a question that I get asked. So I have sent my CV to a recruiter. How long or what's the appropriate time for me to follow up or to chase them if I haven't heard? We, we, we hear a lot about ghosting now and, and not hearing back. So, uh, again, around managing that relationship, um, uh, how, do, how do we you – know, what do you think, Sarah? You jump in and ask, answer that. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it depends in, in what way you're approaching them. So if you're approaching them in the way that we um, just were talking about in terms of how do you initially get yourself noticed? I think if you haven't heard back from them within a week, you're unlikely to hear back from them. So that is probably the point at which to send a, a gentle follow up um, and, and demonstrate your keenness to, to speak to them and to engage with with a particular opportunity. Uh, if you're within a recruitment process, um, you, you really should have a sense of when you might next hear from uh, that recruiter, uh, either because there's a date of a meeting that's happening where there's some decisions that will be made um, or they're going to send the CV across tomorrow and have a conversation the following day and so on. So, And, and if you're not getting that information, then just always feel free to ask that question and, and, and pin them down. Obviously, things do move. Uh, as Harold said earlier, somebody disappears uh, off uh, for a while for whatever reason. Um, but always feel free to ask the question if you're within a process. And again, I think if you haven't heard uh, and you're in a process within a two to three days of when you were expecting to hear, again, well within your rights to, to, to contact them and, and ask for an update, even if it's no update. Um, so, um, you know, I think ne never feel afraid to, to follow up um, if you're engaging in that way, you know, absolutely. And they should come back and say when, when, when there will be an update if there isn't one already. Harold, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think one week is probably a good rule of thumb. Yeah, yeah. 
I like your your phrase, no news is no news. Yeah. I think we always jump to the negative. We always think, oh, well, I haven't heard, therefore it's a no. Yeah. Um, and quite often it could be, you know, 101 reasons that we haven't even thought of. And I think so, the hardest part for a, for a candidate, and I, I've been in that position myself, is, you know, we're all at the center of our own worlds. So everything that's happening with us or what we're doing is the most important. But, you know, unfortunately, <clears throat> other people have other issues that they're dealing with, whether it's, uh, you know, business, uh, things come up. So uh, it's not easy to let that mantra sink in, but maybe just try to remind yourself once in a while so you're not stressing too much. Mm -hmm. No, oh, it's difficult. And I always say they are busy people at the end of the day, and um, you know they are uh, not always on hand when you think they are. They're not just sitting there waiting for your CV to land on their desk. So I think you have to appreciate that. Um, just as uh, before we go to kind of top tips, there's one question come in, uh, slightly more complicated again from a, a LinkedIn member, talking about the use of AI uh, and in terms of utilizing AI aids for their selection process. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, that's something that you come across, uh, Sarah, in terms of uh, declaring what you're using as an AI aid. Um, in terms of that process and how confident are people to trust such aids mm -hmm. when they do use them uh, again not i think not one i can answer in in terms of uh, experience of it i i would have thought that declaring that would be uh, important and what it's being used for and also the wider context in which it's being used in so um i guess the closest example the closest example is uh, some of our clients like to use psychometrics in their final stages, but it's one part of the assessment process and it's uh, used to identify areas that might be explored further in interview or some of the focus groups or some of the other tasks that they might be involved to get in, uh, sorry, to go through as, as they proceed through the process. So um, I think it's always important to be transparent around uh, selection processes and how they're undertaking it uh, and what they're using to do that and also so where that fits into the wider picture of the decision making. Yeah, how old you? Do you I, want to I, I think I think it's reasonable reasonable to be wary. Um, I mean, you've got the the resume filtering software, which has been with us uh, for at least a decade in various levels of ability, um, and there's no perfect software. So um, you know should. You know, recruiters, if they're using them, uh, yeah, it's I think it's reasonable to make candidates aware. But I, on the other hand, it's such a it's like telling in a way. I don't mean to be facetious, but in a way, it's like it's like telling candidates you're using a computer. It's just so mm -hmm. pervasive right now. It's just another tool. Regrettably, that tool can filter you out for no good reason. It may be the formatting that you've chosen on your resume uh, just doesn't fit with their programming and therefore you get bumped out. I think it's a horrible thing. Um, if I was Procter and Gamble and I'm you know, needing to wade through 10,000 resumes, uh, I think I'd do a cost benefit analysis and unfortunately I'd probably you know, move towards the, uh, the resume filtering. Um, so I think you know, AI aids, in HR is still pretty new, but it's coming in very quickly. So um, I think, you know, I, in an ideal world, the any, any advertisement or promotion of a, of a role, uh, when they give you all the details, like where to send the information to, uh, it would be nice to have a disclaimer. All, all um, input will be um, filtered uh, through whatever they want to call it. Um, just so you know, so then you can focus on keywords that you're uh, that are in your resume so that you will get noticed then it's a level playing field at least yeah. excellent tough question um thank you very much um dean has just sent in a question our colleague how might candidates access reviews of recruiters to determine who they want to approach um, on the basis of the experience of others great question we did talk about this slightly earlier about recommendations which i would always say is, is a great route in but um any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I would agree. Uh, well, I go back to the you know, use recommendations, use um, use job websites, and see who's working on the sorts of roles that are piquing your interest, and try and get in that way. Um, I mean, I think if you simple simply Google the name of any recruiter, any search firm, somebody somewhere will have written a review uh, on them um, uh, in in terms of experience. But I don't know that there's an official. Uh, way in which you review recruiters um, in the way that there are of, um, I don't know, college lecturers and doctors and things like that. So I'm not sure there's a go you know, a single go-to place. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was the, the last question. So um, just thinking about top tips, we're coming to the end of the session. Um, if you would like to just give uh, some final thoughts to our listeners um, before we close today, top tips are as a takeaway from today's session. Do you want to go first, Tamara? Uh, sure, I'll jump in. Uh, I was going to say networking, um, but I think we've covered that a bit. Uh, I would say top tip for working with recruiters is to carry on your search and not just you know, let's say you, you've spoken to Sarah. She says you, you might be a fit for one of my assignments. And then you think, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'll just wait. Um, that will not be good for your mental health, I promise you. Uh, so I, I highly recommend that uh, the best way to work with recruiters is to carry on with your search. Continue with your networking. And if something happens with the assignment, you know, that's, that's wonderful. But if something doesn't happen, imagine how you're going to feel three weeks out and now you're at zero in your uh, in the progress of your, your search. So um, carry on is my top tip. Um, and mine is probably a more general one around job search, but just use everything at your disposal in your job search. So your network. The recruiters that uh, you're you're working with and, and working for you, um, but also do the work around what you're looking for. What kind of organisations will excite, you, enthuse you? What are the values that are important to you? What are the skills that you want to be using? What are the red lines when it comes to a job? But you don't need absolute clarity, but a good sense of that um, is is important because then those around you, whether they're your friends, your colleagues, your wider network, um, a recruiter, what they'll be able to bounce off that and support you better than if you're not, if you don't, if you haven't done that work and don't have any of that clarity. Perfect guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, and I uh, have no more questions. Hopefully everybody who's listened to this live has had their questions answered. Uh, our next session is the 4th of December with Dean um, talking about creating a CV specifically for NED or charity purposes. So please join us then. And thank you for those of you who have joined us today. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye -bye.